We are only a few hours away from the release of the first three episodes of the Andor series on Disney+. Plus. Here's a preview of what to expect in the first four episodes. Hello and welcome to Coffee on Corban. If this is your first time here, I greatly appreciate you taking the time to click on this video. I just got a notification a few minutes ago for this article on TV Line, I think is the website, but it was a review of the first four episodes and what to expect. So if you don't want spoilers, go ahead and not watch this video, I suppose. But if you want to get every little bit of information as quickly as possible, kind of like I do, then stick around. We're going to dig into this article talking about what we can expect in the first few episodes. It seems like the theme of this review is it's different from the Star Wars we've gotten before, and that's not a bad thing. So let me pull up the article here. Google knows what I like. Uh, it always sends me Star Wars notifications on, you know, whatever the news articles that come out are. Sometimes they are lame things like, you know, Mace Windu's returning, but we already knew that for months already. But here is the article. And it looks like the guy that wrote this, the reviewer, is Matt Webb Mitovich, maybe? I don't know. But it's on TV line. And or review. Rogue One prequel differs from every Star Wars series before it in the best ways. Well, consider me intrigued. I am very excited. I've been telling people for about a year that this show is going to be the, the hidden sleeping giant. No one is really expecting this to do well. Um, but it's about more than just Cassie and Andor the character. I'm really excited to see what this show has to offer. Very angry face right there. That's always interesting. The origin of the Rebel Alliance, intelligence officer Cassie and Andor, and what drew him into the good fight is at the fore of Disney Plus's latest live-action Star Wars series, which is a slow-burn espionage tale worth sticking with. With, and that's that's what I've been telling people for quite a while. It's a slow burn. And, you know, it's going to take a little while to build up momentum. And I think that is exactly why they're releasing these first three episodes all at once uh, for the premiere is the first two are there's so much to set up because us Star Wars fans, we know who the CIS is. We know about the Clone Wars and what led into the formation of the Empire. We know how that all set up. But for the general public, they don't really know all those details. And so if we throw them into the story, they're going to be lost. They're not going to have any idea what's going on. But if you release episode one and there's just set up, episode two and there's just set up, by the time they get to episode three, half your people are falling off. And OK, I'll, I'll wait for something I know, like Ahsoka to come out or maybe one of the other major movies that they might have planned in the future. So slow burn. I'm not surprised by that. I'm expecting something major in episode three, but let's continue with this article right here. Uh, premiering this Wednesday with its first three episodes of 12, uh, and this guy has seen the first four, uh, save some flashbacks to a formative incident in the title character's childhood, is set five years prior to the events of the heist drama Rogue One. So this is five years before the Battle of Yavin is what it looks like uh, from this article. Uh, season one will span a year in time. That's what we can expect this year, while season two, which is already confirmed, will cover the remaining four leading up to Rogue One. So it doesn't sound like from that that we'll get a third season, but that is totally fine with me. The premiere finds Cassian, again played by Rogue One's Diego Luna, skulking around the red light district on the planet Morlana One. That's a new planet, I believe. I haven't heard that before. Where he's asking around about someone who disappeared from his life. I wonder who that could be. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to find out when the series drops in just a few hours. Uh, following a most unfortunate series of events, Cassian flees home to the mining planet Ferrix with Deputy Inspector Cyril Karn, and it lists a bunch of other people here. Um, there is a droid, B2 EMO, uh, voiced by Dave Chapman. Uh, I believe he also voiced BB 8, based on what it says right there. Uh, interesting. So, Cassian's extremely precarious situation leads him on a request. To request a favor from Bix, who through her business exploits has an in with the well-connected. Other cast members include uh, Mon Mothma. We already knew that. A um, couple other people. Interesting. Uh, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this article. What makes Andor stand out from most Star Wars TV series that came before it is that it is not here to answer some burning questions steeped in mythology from any film trilogy. 
For example, how did Boba Fett escape the Sarlacc pit? Or what was Obi-Wan Kenobi up to between episodes three and four? And this is something that I have talked about for a while and, and how I think that they're not going to really mess this up all that badly. Because you, you're talking about Obi-Wan Kenobi. That is a well-established character. You talk about Boba Fett. It's someone that people have ingrained in their childhood and in their mind. They know what these characters do very well. Uh, you can ask him anything about them. And I guess you could argue, argue in the case of Boba Fett that we didn't really have a whole lot to go on. But people have their preconceptions about what these characters do, what kind of information we're going to get about their travels and their expeditions. And so when you differ from what people are expecting, they're going to revolt. Um, we saw that in, in the sequel trilogy, where Luke wasn't the person we thought he would. Uh, they changed some of the mechanics of the Star Wars universe, and people didn't respond well to that. But with this series, really the only people we know so far, I believe, are Mon Mothma and Cassian Andor, and maybe a couple cameos of other people we've seen before. But as far as like major story points or beloved characters, there's not a whole lot that they can mess up which I think is a recipe for success for them because they can take risks. They can give us something different than what we've seen before. And although fans are always going to find something to complain about, it's not going to be personally offensive to those people, although they have no right to lay claim to those characters because it's just something that we all enjoy. But I think that is a recipe for success for the show. There's not a whole lot that they can mess up uh, terribly offensively. Uh, judging by the measured reader response to uh, and recover to date, perhaps you don't consider yourself innately vested in the tale to be told here. Yes, it's a bit of a slow burn in the early goings. The decision to launch the first three episodes, which run 35 to 40 minutes each, that's a good runtime, was a prudent one. But by the end of episode three, and absolutely at the close of episode four, you'll be most anxious to see what happens next. Rogue One co-writer Tony Gilroy serves as showrunner and penned Andor's first three episodes as well as 11 and 12, and you can fell the same smart caper-based tone he brought to Cass's big screen introduction. And this this is another thing that I'm really looking forward to in this show is, is Rogue One-esque action, storytelling, uh, drama. Uh, I, I loved Rogue One. Some people have character issues with, you know, Jin Erso, and they say she's not the best written character, but the immersion into the Star Wars universe was absolutely there with Rogue One. And we got to see kind of the human aspect of what goes on in that galaxy far, far away. Not to mention the visuals based on the trailers look straight out of the prequels, which for me, it, <laughs> it, it ticks all the nostalgia boxes for me. So I'm really excited for that. And I think if they, if they, do that well, uh, and I, I said this a couple live streams ago, if they take the prequels visuals and the connections that we have from the prequels and the storytelling and the visual appearance of Rogue One and the connections to the Rebellion and the start of the Re Rebel Alliance that we have in the original trilogy, I think that is a very powerful combination and they could knock it out of the park with this. This is why I've been saying People are sleeping on this show. It's it's going to come by, and and the people that are paying attention to it, it's really going to take them by storm, uh, more so than they expect. And on first glance, this show didn't really sound that appealing. Okay, Cassie and Andor, I guess he's kind of a cool character, but is there really enough there to make a series out of? And then I started to think, okay, this is about, uh, especially now that I know that it's from the, the Confederacy of Independent Systems side of it, which is where we know that Andor grew up on a CIS planet, but we get to see the formation of the rebellion. How did that start? That is so interesting to me. World building is the most important aspect to me in all of Star Wars, more so than the characters, more than the action. Um, the world building. I want to know what is going on uh, in these places, which is why I like the prequels, because all the politics is very interesting for me. But let's keep going and see what else we can find in this article. I know this is a little bit longer of a video, but thank you for your watch time. <laughs> if you like what you see, um, consider subscribing. You don't have to, but I would greatly appreciate it. We're working our way towards 1000 and um, we've we've built a pretty nice community here, especially for live streams. Uh, we've got some a lot of regular viewers that tune into that. Um, I bring people on a lot of times for those live streams. Just a very great time. Uh, positive, uh, very philosophical and thought provoking community that we have here. So let's keep going in this article. 
in discussing what distinguishes Andor from The Mandalorian, The Book of Boba Fett, and Obi-Wan Kenobi, we must also talk about its look. As TV Line reported, Andor did not use the volume, which I think is very important um, in distinguishing it from the feel of Book of Boba Fett and Mandalorian and what we've gotten previously. The Super HD digital backgrounds that provide the backdrops for Disney Plus's Star Wars series. If you don't know what the volume is, go check out Disney Plus. They've got specials on how they'd use it. It's basically a TV background um, in essence that is made to look real and provide accurate lighting so they can shoot things right in frame. Uh, and then that minimal, minimal CGI editing uh, in post-production. Uh, the streets and... Uh, the difference is not only refreshing, but frankly staggering. The streets and alleys of Morlana 1 and Ferrex feel gritty and tactile. Backgrounds have actual depth. Valleys are lush. Earthen paths are not putting, putting green perfect. The result is a truly cinematic look that Mando et al. surely believe. I don't know what et al. is. I'm not that fancy. Um, they are emulating, yet not to this degree. The cast surrounding Luna is solid. Shaw with every look. I don't know about that. But... Um, Overall, I'm just really floored with this um, series as far as I can tell what we're going to get. Um, that article provided some some really cool information about how this show is set apart from the ones we've gotten previously. And again, it's not going to be a show just about Cassie and Andor, although he is the lead character. And I sincerely hope that he is a very interesting character and his character arc takes him from who he is as a child. I believe there are some rumors about his father being hanged by the Republic forces uh, during the Clone Wars um, all the way through his adulthood. I want to see that character arc to where we see him in Rogue One. Uh, and then eventually by the end of season two, I want to see how smoothly that flows into Rogue One. Um, there's a lot of potential there, but mostly the world building. I want to know what is happening at this time and how the rebellion is formed, especially, you know, in the Empire, in the upper echelons of the the hierarchy of you know the the social elites so to speak on coruscant that that's super interesting to me and i really hope the show delivers on it but that is going to do it for the video if you've enjoyed any of this again i humbly ask you subscribe you don't have to but i would greatly appreciate it if you've been here from the very beginning of the video i greatly appreciate your time may the stash be with you and i will see you wherever i happen to see you in the galaxy